everybody. So it's a great pleasure to invite the uh, chairman of the first session post lunch. So let me invite Professor S. Shankaranarayanan from IIT Bombay. So his research interest mainly lies in the field of gravity and cosmology. Uh, so he will be chairing the first session. So Professor Shankaranarayanan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all for the fifth session of the symposium. Uh, in this session, we, we have with us two great physicists and speakers focusing mostly on cosmology. The first speaker is uh, Professor Lord Martin Rees from Cambridge. The second, second speaker is Professor Subhi Sarkar from Oxford. Let me first introduce the first speaker of this session. Professor Martin Rees is UK's Astronomer Royal. He is based at Cambridge University, where he is a fellow and a former master of uh, Trinity College. He is a member of the House of Lords and a former president of the Royal Society. His research interests include space exploration, black holes, galaxy formation, the multiverse, and prospect of extraterrestrial life. He is a co-founder of the Center of the Study of uh, Existential Risks at Cambridge University. In addition to academic publications, research papers, he has written many general articles and 10 books, most recently on the future prospects for humanity. Today, he's going to talk to us about our cosmic origins. How big is our universe? Over to Professor Martin. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, let me first say what a privilege it is to be able to speak to you in Bangalore, even though it's a sad occasion, remembering Kumar, who I think I first met uh, more than 50 years ago uh, when I was a graduate student and he was a postdoc. He was about three years senior to me. Um, but he had uh, very long connections with Cambridge, and uh, I thought I'd start off um, with a picture of um, uh, my college in Cambridge, um, and um, uh, uh, a picture also of uh, the best student we ever had in Cambridge. Here he is, Isaac Newton. And uh, uh, in 1665, uh, the college was closed down because of the plague, and uh, uh, according to legend, Newton had his great idea while he was working at home under an apple tree. Well, I'm afraid the college is closed down again now uh, for the pandemic, uh, but whether any of the students will come up with equal insights, I just don't know. But uh, Newton, uh, of course, uh, thought about the solar system. And what I'm going to do in this talk um, is give it in four stages. I'm going to talk about um, our planetary system, um, other planetary systems, in our galaxy, and then about other galaxies and how they originated, and finally to speculate about might there be other big bangs apart from ours. But let's start off with more familiar things in our solar system. Newton would have been aware of the uh, Copernican system uh, of the planets, and of course, famously, he uh, understood the uh, orbits of the planets according to his inverse square law. Newton also must have thought about space travel. This is a famous illustration from his book, which shows um, the trajectory of uh, cannonballs being fired from a mountaintop. And uh, if they're fired fast enough, uh, then they go into orbit. Uh, this is still, I think, the neatest way to explain to students the concept of orbital flight. And he calculated that in order to go into orbit, uh, the cannonball has to go at about 18,000 miles an hour far beyond what was then possible. And uh, as you know, it wasn't until 1957 that the Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union, the first object to actually go into orbit. And since that time, of course, um, uh, space probes have been to all the uh, planets of our solar system, uh, bringing back uh, images of varied and distinctive worlds. Just a very quick tour. If you were going out from, this, from the Earth uh, in the solar system, if you look back from, say, 10 million miles away, you see something like this. Here's the Earth and the Moon with the Sun coming from the right. And uh, then you would get to the red planet, Mars. And of course, uh, as we know, uh, many um, probes have been to Mars and some have landed on it, uh, several uh, have and the most recent 
uh, probe to land on Mars is the American Perseverance probe. This is a picture of it, and uh, this landed, and it will be trundling around on the surface of Mars, trying to understand the geology, and also uh, looking for any vestiges of past life that might have been there. Going further out in the solar system, we get to Jupiter, uh, when we have uh, uh, there. Oh, this is a, a picture of the northern pole of Jupiter, taken by the Juno spacecraft, showing what the weather's like there. These are lots of little cyclones there. This is taken by the Juno spacecraft. And of course, there have been close-ups of the uh, moons of Jupiter. These are the four classical moons uh, first discovered uh, by Galileo, uh, which Newton would have known about. And then, uh, going further out, uh, the Saturn and the Cassini probe spent 13 years orbiting around Saturn and its moons. It sent back this rather nice picture. This shows an eclipse of the Sun by Saturn. Cassini is lined up beyond Saturn at just such a distance that Saturn covers uh, the image of the Sun. Uh, but you can still see the lights sh shining on the, the rings of Saturn. Um, and uh, you can't quite see it, but the Earth is at the end of that, uh, that little arrow there. Saturn has a variety of moons. Um, this is part of the surface of Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. And it looks rather nice with little lakes and little rivers, uh, but the temperature's minus 160 degrees centigrade, and uh, these uh, uh, lakes are liquid methane. And here's another very different satellite. This is Enceladus, uh, which has an icy surface. And we know there's a liquid water under this surface. And some of the um, uh, water sprays out through the surface. And there'll be a probe to go and see uh, if the chemical analysis of that uh, water indicates that there might be anything swimming underneath. We just don't know. But it can't be ruled out. And then further out still, um, uh, the uh, New Horizon probe sent back pictures like this of Pluto, uh, which is 12,000 times further away than the moon is from us sending back these pictures. And the point I'd like to make is that Cassini and New Horizons were based on 1990s technology. This, uh, it takes several years to build them, 10 years on their journey. And if we think how smartphones have improved since then, think how much better we could do with probes of the outer solar system uh, sending uh, probes in the coming decades. Well, is there any life anywhere in uh, our solar system? Uh, we don't know, no one expects anything other than vestiges of life, um, but the situation changes if we go beyond the reach of any space probe and think about the realm of the stars. Because one of the things we've learned in the last 25 years, particularly in the last 10 years, is that most stars are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. Um, and this is a picture of, of, my, of my colleague, uh, Didier Kello, uh, He's very cheerful. He won the Nobel Prize just before he, this photo was taken uh, for discovering back in 1995 when he was a student, uh, the first exoplanet. He's gone on to a wonderful career of uh, finding many hundreds of others. They're found by two techniques. One is looking for the wobble they induce in the star, but the most popular technique is uh, looking for the effect of transits. And let me just explain what, what, how that works. If a planet uh, moves across the face of a star, then of course, even if you can't uh, resolve the image, then it'll block out a bit of the light from the star. And so um, uh, you can infer um, from uh, watching a star which gets dimmer, how big the planet is from what fraction of the starlight it uh, absorbs. For instance, if you were looking at the uh, Earth going across the sun, uh, the sun will get fainter by one part in 10,000 because the uh, Earth is about 1% of the radius, 10 to minus 4 of the area. And of course, the interval between successive dips will tell you the length of the year. And the uh, uh, spacecraft uh, Kepler uh, 
uh, spent three and a half years uh, looking at a patch of sky about seven degrees across and monitoring the brightness of the 150,000 stars with a photometric precision of one part in 100,000, looking for just these things. And it found many, many thousands of cases of planets where it could measure um, the length of their years and also uh, how, uh, how big they were. Um, and in the bottom left, you, you can see this rather silly picture um, shows a lot of the data plotted where the, um, uh, um, the frequency scales were the year and the size scales were uh, the um, size of the planet. So uh, there's many, many hundreds, even thousands of objects have been found and there's an immense variety and I don't have time to go, go in for this, but let me just show you one very remarkable object, which was, which was found not by Kepler, uh, but by um, uh, a uh, team, partly Belgian, partly British. They found this miniature solar system. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, a, a dwarf star, 1% as bright as this sun, and orbiting it are seven planets. And the innermost planet has a year lasting one and a half Earth days, and the outer one has a period of about two or three Earth weeks. So it's a very, very small scale uh, planetary system. And uh, uh, the, the data here uh, is very good. This was found in the with a 22 inch telescope, but the, it was followed up by data from the Spitzer spacecraft. And this just indicates stacking the various orbits that is very, very good data from which you can infer the sizes of the planets and their, their orbits. And um, uh, incidentally, the outermost three planets of this system are in the habitable zone in the sense that the temperature such that water could exist, neither boiling away nor staying frozen. Um, but they wouldn't be um, uh, very Earth-like. For one reason, they would be tightly locked, just as the moon is tightly locked to the Earth. So one half of them would be uh, in perpetual light, one half in perpetual darkness. So there'd be a kind of um, uh, apartheid, everyone living in the bright side, except the astronomers who'd be on the back side uh, in the perpetual darkness. But it's most unlikely there's any life out there. Well, should we be surprised to find planets around orbital stars? I think we should be very surprised at the huge variety uh, of the planets and the systems. They're not all like our solar system, but we are not surprised that there are uh, planets around other stars because this cartoon uh, shows our idea of how a star forms. Uh, a contracting dusty gas cloud um, uh, pulled itself together under gravity. Um, if it's got even a small amount of spin, angular momentum, it'll spin up as it contracts and it will uh, 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 contract to make a star and, and it'll spin off a disc around it, a dusty disc uh, carrying most of the angular momentum. And from that disc, um, uh, star uh, planets will form by the agglomeration of, uh, of dust and gas. This is a scenario uh, which uh, uh, we would expect to be pretty ubiquitous. So we're not surprised that there should be uh, lots, lots of planets around um, uh, around lots of stars. And uh, incidentally, to uh, have another flashback to, to Newton, uh, uh, Newton uh, um, understood the orbits of the planets, why they were elliptical, but he didn't understand uh, why they were all more or less in the same plane, what we call the ecliptic, and uh, all going around it the same way. And he, he thought uh, that this, this was uh, uh, some God-given uniformity, uh, which he said was rather like the symmetry in bilateral symmetry in animals. He thought this was something which, uh, some deep explanation. Whereas now, of course, uh, uh, it's a natural consequence of the origin of all the planets in a planetary system from a single uh, spinning disk. Well, one of the problems with understanding these exoplanets is that we don't in general see them directly, except for a few big ones. We see their effect on the parent star, the wobble caused by its gravity, or in the examples I've shown, uh, the uh, effect on the apparent brightness of a star if a planet transits in front. 
what we'd really like to do is to be able to actually um, even detect the light from the star itself. And that's very hard. Um, to give an example, suppose there were some aliens out there, say 50 light years away, looking at our solar system. Then from that distance, our sun would look an ordinary star and the earth would look in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and a billion times fainter. You're looking for a far fly next to a searchlight, as it were. But if the aliens had a big enough telescope that they could separate out the light from the Earth, then they could learn quite a bit about our Earth. For instance, the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could infer there were continents and oceans, the length of the day, and maybe by analyzing the spectrum, they could an, uh, infer uh, something about the uh, biosphere, the seasons, and uh, indeed there's a, a feature due to chlorophyll, they could discover lots of vegetation. Now, we can't yet do that, but we should be able to. And uh, uh, one of the instruments that'll help a lot is this one shown here, um, which is being built in Chile by a consortium of European countries, European Southern Observatory, which, uh, um, which Britain belongs to. Uh, and they're not very imaginative in their names. It's called the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope. And uh, it's, it's already being built. And uh, its mirror will be 39 meters across, <clears throat> not one sheet of glass, uh, but a, a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass. But uh, when fitted with a high resolution spectrograph, this would be able to gather enough light to be able to uh, um, get a crude spectrum, at least, of Earth-like planets orbiting the nearest stars. The James Webb Space Telescope may do this, uh, uh, but I think the, we expect more definite results from the European ELT, which will be online between five and 10 years from now. So that will give us evidence, perhaps, of whether there's any sort of vegetation um, on any of these, um, these planets. Of course, what people really want to find is evidence for intelligent life, but that's another story for another talk. Oh, uh, uh, why do I show this picture? Um, this is a, a drawing uh, from uh, Robert Hooke's first book, and Robert Hooke was Newton's least favorite colleague uh, at the Royal Society. He had an early microscope and he could draw wonderfully. And this uh, was a flea, uh, which he drew it in his, his book in 1660. And the reason I show this is a bit of modesty on behalf of astronomers, because uh, uh, we talk about stars um, and atoms, um, and I'm going to say a bit more about star formation, um, but all that is very, very easy uh, compared to biology because um, uh, uh, even a small insect like this flea has layer upon layer of complex structure and is far more complicated than a star or a galaxy. So uh, let's be very modest if we feel we can understand uh, the evolution um, and, and structure of stars. But uh, what about that? that? That's my next topic, stars and atoms. How do stars form and how do the atoms form that they're made of? Well, uh, this is just a, a, a depiction which shows a sort of time lapse of the evolution of stars. <clears throat> I guess most, uh, most of you are familiar with this in some sense, that uh, <clears throat> stars like the sun um, uh, evolve slowly. They last about 10 billion years um, and uh, leave white dwarfs and, and big, bigger stars will end up as new stars or black holes. We see places where new stars are forming now, as in that cartoon where they contract uh, into and <clears throat> uh, form a disk. This is the Eagle Nebula <clears throat> where stars are forming and we see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in about 6 billion years when it runs out of, uh, of fuel in the center, it'll blow off its outer layers and settle down as a white dwarf. But the bigger stars burn their fuel more quickly and brightly and end in a more dramatic way. And this, as I expect everyone knows, this is the Crab Nebula, the um, debris from a 
uh, supernova witnessed and recorded by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. And uh, I don't know if anyone speaks Chinese, but I'm told this is the report of the uh, uh, emperor's uh, court astronomer that a guest star had appeared and become brighter than the moon and faded away after a few weeks. And at that point in the sky, we now see the debris from that explosion. Now, these, um, uh, uh, these supernova explosions and their debris, uh, here it is again, they may seem far away and long ago, but uh, they, are, they are crucial uh, to our existence because <clears throat> it's, it's through them that all the atoms of which we are made were created. And the people who did the most to do this were this quartet. Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle. Uh, they wrote a classic paper in 1957 uh, uh, um, uh, where they showed uh, that a star, a big star, uh, when it is near the end of its life, has a sort of onion skin structure. It burns the hotter inner layers further up the periodic table. And when it flings that material out into space, then it, uh, uh, that, that, that material then merges with the interstellar medium as the Crab Nebula debris will in a few thousand years. This picture incidentally was taken in 1971 in Cambridge um, for Willie Fowler's 60th birthday. And uh, he was a model train enthusiast. And uh, I don't know, I think Komar may have been at this, at this conference. It was a very big, big well-attended conference we had in Cambridge, a very nice occasion. And um, this is Margaret Burbage. She died a few months ago at the age of 100. And this is a picture of her at the age of 100 opening a Christmas card, big Christmas card, which we sent her on that occasion. So she had a wonderful life uh, and she um, uh, died just a, a year ago at the age of 100. But what they had shown, and it's been corroborated by uh, data ever since they wrote their classic paper in 1957, is that our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy is a sort of a ecological system where pristine gas, which is mainly hydrogen and helium, uh, gets uh, um, uh, incorporated into stars. The small stars just live for a long time, but the big stars explode and they contaminate the interstellar gas with all the chemical elements and they form new stars. So all the atoms of which we are made, carbon, oxygen, iron, and all the rest, were made in stars that lived and died before our solar system formed. So we are um, literally the ashes of long dead stars, or if we're less romantic, we're the nuclear waste from the fuel that made stars shine. And this is a wonderful story uh, where it's like going back before Darwin. Darwin said how life uh, got started. Uh, this work shows where the atoms came from that made the life and made the planets in the life. So this was a great uh, uh, discovery. And this happened within our, in our galaxy. But of course, the next uh, step in my expanding horizons in this talk is that uh, um, our Milky Way galaxy is just one of literally billions we can see for, with a big telescope. If we could get three million light years away from our Milky Way and look back, it would look something like this. Um, this, of course, is Andromeda, our nearest uh, big galaxy in space, a spinning disk viewed obliquely and uh, uh, attaining about 200 billion stars. And here's another galaxy. And this is uh, um, uh, a map showing within a certain range of latitudes all the galaxies out to about five or 600 million light years, uh, showing that they are scattered through space. They're not uniformly distributed. They are grouped together in, in clusters. We're in a small group uh, with Andromeda and about 20 or 30 smaller members and the Virgo cluster 
uh, it, about uh, 40 million light years away um, is the nearest big cluster. Well, you might want to ask, how can we actually understand what galaxies are made of? If we were particle physicists, we would take the particles by studying and crash them together. But of course, we can't do experiments. We can't crash stars and galaxies together. Um, but we can, in the virtual world of our computer, ask what would happen. And we can ask what would happen if two galaxies crash together and do a, a, a simulation, including gravity and gas dynamics. And this is an example of, uh, uh, of uh, such a simulation. Two galaxies are crashing together and um, uh, the sort of train wreck and uh, the orbital phases all mix up and you end up with an amorphous elliptical galaxy where there were once two separate galaxies. And uh, I should warn everyone that uh, this is going to happen in that Andromeda is going to hit our Milky Way in about 4 billion years. Um, and then there'll be no disks left. And this is a real picture of two galaxies. Um, and having done lots of calculations like the one I just showed you with models, uh, we would infer that what's happened here is that these two galaxies have got dangerously close. They pulled out a tidal plume on, on one of them. Uh, and if we came back in 100 million years, we'd probably find that these two galaxies uh, had merged uh, into one uh, amorphous elliptical galaxy. And incidentally, uh, when we do these simulations, uh, we get the best fit to the morphology of galaxies if we include in the mix, not just the stars and gas, but so-called dark matter. Uh, there is uh, gravitating stuff which behaves like a swarm of uh, non-interacting neutral particles, um, uh, which uh, um, form, and there's about five times as much gravitating stuff in those as in all the uh, stars and gas we see. There's lots of other evidence, but dark matter, as you all know, is an important constituent of the universe. Now, of course, ast astronomers have the advantage over geologists in that they actually, actually observe the past, because when we look at very distant objects, we're seeing them as they were a long way away and a long way back in the past. And uh, uh, this picture, um, this is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, and this shows a patch of sky about five arc minutes across. It would take uh, um, several dozen pictures like this to cover the area of the full moon. And uh, in this small area, you see literally hundreds of little smudges, each a galaxy, many fully equal of ours, and many of them more than 10 billion light years away. So we're seeing these galaxies as they were a long time ago. And let me show you a spectrum of one of them. Um, you can't see the faint objects there, um, but this is a tracing of a spectrum of uh, one of the objects in that field. Um, and uh, the main point I want to show is that um, uh, uh, the Lyman Alpha line of hydrogen, which is normally in the far ultraviolet, 1216 angstroms, is stretched by a factor 8.1 and appears at just above 10,000 angstroms here. This, this is the very large redshift indicating we look at some looking at something a very long way away in our expanding universe. This object is not a normal galaxy. It can be, uh, it's, it's bright and, and yields this good spectrum because um, what we're seeing is not the light from the stars, but the light from the gas, which is energized by um, a black hole. And another great discovery um, of the last uh, few decades is that um, uh, massive black holes lurk in the centers of most galaxies um, between a few million and even a few billion solar masses. And um, when a gas swirls into them with magnetic fields, um, the radiation from that process outshines all the stars in the galaxy. And we get what's called a quasar, uh, which is far brighter. And that object with a very large redshift uh, uh, it was actually a quasar. And of course, uh, although this is not my topic, um, uh, black holes are crucially important to manifestations of Einstein's uh, theory of gravity. And they're really amazing. And uh, let me give um, this quotation from um, Chandrasekhar, um, who's 
who says um, how amazed he was to realize that objects actually exist as an important part of the universe, which were exactly represented by equations which we could calculate from Einstein's equations. They're standardized objects with mass and spin and no other important parameters. And they're all described by uh, the so-called Kerr solution, which was first discovered by this man, Roy Kerr, in the early 1960s. Uh, and he didn't realize how important it was, but we now know that any black hole when it's settled down into equilibrium, which are gravitational waves, etc., uh, will be described by these equations. So uh, black holes um, um, are uh, simpler even than stars. They're described just by those, those two parameters. Um, and uh, they manifest the extreme um, consequences of Einstein's theory. There again, that's another story. Now, um, I've talked about galaxies. Um, uh, I'd earlier talked about stars. What about the largest scale we can observe, the observable universe? Well, here again, uh, here's a historic picture. This was taken in the 1950s, I think. And it's Fred Hoyle on the left. Um, he believed then that the universe didn't really have a beginning. It was in a steady state. It expanded, but new galaxies formed in the gaps, as it were, there. On the right, there's uh, Georges Lemaitre, who was actually a Belgian priest, but he, right back in the 1920s, had been the pioneer of the Big Bang. He called it a primordial atom, and so, he, he, and I'm sure that's what they're talking about in this picture. And uh, uh, Fred Hoyle um, never really accepted the Big Bang. He ended up his, his life with some complicated sort of compromised steady bang picture, uh, but the uh, evidence for the Big Bang uh, really convinced almost everyone after the work of these two people in 1965. Um, this is uh, uh, Penjit and Wilson at the Bell Telephone Labs, and they found that um, the uh, sky is pervaded by weak microwaves coming from all directions, um, which uh, uh, turned out from later measurements to have a pretty exact black body spectrum, and they are uh, interpreted as the relic of the universe's hot, dense beginnings. As the universe expanded, the radiation cooled, the wavelength stretched, it fills the universe, it's nowhere else to go, and this radiation has a temperature of about 2.7 degrees Kelvin. And it's now been very intensively studied. And from the late 1960s onwards, um, um, uh, a, a model, a time chart of the universe was developed, which I, I show here. Um, and a, a few key points are when we uh, time is measured upwards, present at the top, and the most distant um, quasars um, look back to when the universe was about a tenth of its present age. Um, the um, uh, radiation we see uh, came from, um, uh, it was last scattered when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old, and the temperature was a few thousand degrees. If you go back still further, uh, the gas was ionized and it's rather like the inside of a star. So the gas, uh, and that's when the gas came into thermal equilibrium. And uh, we can extrapolate back um, and we got good evidence for what happened when it was a few seconds old, because that's when nuclear reactions happened that converted hydrogen into deuterium, uh, helium and lithium. And the portion of those elements matches what you would expect from the Big Bang. And I think most people would say that we can extrapolate for some confidence uh, back to about a nanosecond. I say a nanosecond because that's when all the particles had about the same thermal energy as the energy produced in the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. So we've got some empirical evidence of what things were like right back to a nanosecond. But um, this leads to an issue which I know Kumar worried about. Uh, if the universe started off as this sort of amorphous equilibrium situation. Um, uh, how did it end up so intricately structured? It seems contrary to the second law of thermodynamics to start off with something uniform and end up with an amazingly complex universe with temperatures ranging from the interior of stars to the coldness of the dark night sky. But the answer to that mystery is 
the effect of gravity. Gravity enhances density contrasts. And uh, as the universe expands, then uh, um, the density contrasts grow. This, sh this shows um, a, a picture um, where the expansion is subtracted out, uh, but as the universe expands, uh, you see the, um, uh, the dark matter clustering, and then you see the, uh, the gas itself clustering, and this is when the first structures form. And lots of simulations have been done like this. And what's been a great triumph of, uh, uh, of cosmology is, is this, that uh, the fluctuations which are fed in as the initial conditions here are, are, are not just made up, they're not just put in by chance, um, they are uh, obtained by uh, uh, taking the data from the Planck spacecraft. This is a projection of the entire sky and uh, uh, this shows the fluctuations. Their amplitude is about one part in tenth in, in 100,000. Uh, if they didn't exist, the universe now would be just a uniform, cold, dark hydrogen, no stars and no people. But it's, it's these fluctuations which eventually enhance their density contrast and condense out. And there's real quantitative detail. Um, the fluctuations aren't just white noise. They have this, uh, um, as a function of, if you do a four analysis, then they have a peak at an amplitude of about one degree and then uh, uh, various other structures. And uh, I think one of the most amazing diagrams in, uh, in science is this one, where you can predict these wiggles and you can understand them. And from this diagram alone, you can infer the geometry of the universe and the density in atoms and in dark matter. A word about the future of the universe. Um, again, um, uh, the, the uh, pictures that people thought the universe might eventually recollapse, a big crunch, or they thought it might just decelerate, but not have enough density to eventually stop expanding. But uh, about 20 years ago, it was realized that the universe was now accelerating. This was a big surprise, but this indicated that uh, um, there is energy latent in empty space, uh, which has the properties um, of, of vacuum energy, which has a negative uh, pressure, positive energy, and in Einstein's equations, this causes an expansion. So there's a whole network of arguments, which I won't have time to go into, uh, which um, uh, uh, indicate that we are in a universe uh, where um, ordinary matter plus dark matter contributes 30% of the so-called critical uh, density, which makes the universe um, dynamically flat. Uh, the other 70% is made up of this exotic material, empty space, which has the property of negative pressure, so it's more important now than it was in the past. And so this is the uh, famous pi diagram, uh, but just a, a, a warning, a sort of commercially point that although this makes dark energy look more important than dark matter, um, that's true of the present, but if you go back into the past, dark matter is very important. Uh, but dark energy isn't. So dark energy is a fundamental physical problem, whereas if you want to understand galaxy morphology and how they formed, you don't need to worry about dark energy, but you do need to worry about dark, about the dark matter. And without the dark matter, we couldn't understand galaxy formation as in those uh, um, simulations. Well, all progress brings into, uh, into focus new questions. So we don't know what causes the fluctuations, what does why does the universe expand the way it does? Why does it contain the observed mix of atoms, radiation, and dark matter? Well, here I put up a hazard sign because I mentioned that we could uh, infer with some confidence what the universe was like back to a nanosecond. And that's incidentally when the observable universe would have been shrunk down to the size of the solar system. But to answer those three questions, we've got to go back much, much further still, possibly uh, to a time when the universe was the size of an apple or cricket ball, much, much, much smaller. And uh, here, of course, the physics is very, very speculative, but there are various ideas about the uh, possible physics. Um, and uh, uh, one idea is that the fluctuations 
which are the original seeds of galaxy formation and are seen in the uh, micro background, that they are quantum fluctuations made when the entire present universe was of microscopic size and it underwent this period of inflation. And uh, this idea which dates back 40 years. It's not battle tested, but it uh, does explain many features of our universe. And just in my last five minutes, um, uh, let me just uh, address another uh, question, um, which is um, how big is the universe? How extensive is the physical reality, which is within the remit of science? Well, um, we know about the, uh, we, we can look with big telescopes and we can see back a very, very long way. Um, and we, we see to a sort of horizon beyond which light can't, uh, uh, can't have had time to reach us. And in an accelerated universe, this horizon is rather like uh, the horizon around a black hole. Galaxies disappear over it. And so there's a definite volume which we can see. But just as if you're in the middle of an ocean, there's a horizon around you, but that's got no physical significance. The ocean doesn't end just beyond that. Likewise, the distribution of galaxies could go on far, far beyond our present horizon. How much beyond, we don't know. Fairly good evidence suggests it goes on about 100 times further. The reason for that is that the uh, um, asymmetry between looking as far as you can in that direction and the opposite direction sees very little difference. So the gradient across our observed universe is very small. So that suggests if it's a finite structure, it's much bigger. And it could be so much bigger that the um, uh, that all combinatorial options are fulfilled. That there's another Earth, another avatars of all of us, etc. That would have to be far, far bigger. That's not logically impossible. But all that isn't the end of a story, because all this structure, vastly bigger than the observable volume of the universe, could be just the aftermath of, as it were, our Big Bang. But this raises another question, um, is, is our Big Bang the only one? And this is a cartoon of uh, uh, the idea of an eternal inflation, <clears throat> which is due to Andre Linde. Um, and, uh, uh, and it symbolically shows um, in, in bottom right, um, our universe, our horizon, and lots of guys beyond that. But this whole thing is just part of one space-time volume uh, in some sort of infinite ensemble. Uh, which he calculated in some detail and uh, worked out what the physics would need to be at this high, um, at, at this time, if we were to um, uh, live in in such a system. Well, um, we would like to know if the physical reality is so much bigger than this. Um, are the physical laws the same everywhere? They're the same everywhere in the universe we can see. Atoms and distant guys are like those here, but could these physical laws be the same everywhere uh, or could they be different? And that's a fascinating question. Now, whenever I talk about the multiverse, people say, well, isn't this just metaphysics? Is it a scientific question? And I would say it is a scientific question, but it will remain a speculative question unless and until we have a theory which can describe the early inflationary phase of the universe. And that theory has gained credibility by accounting for some phenomena which we can observe or can test. You don't need to be able to test all the consequences of the theory. You need to be able to test enough of them, have confidence in the theory, and we then believe other things. For instance, let's say general relativity. We can test in many ways. And we therefore take seriously what it says about the inside of black holes, which we can't observe. So if we get to that stage and we can test whether the physics has the properties that Andre Linde's model needs, then um, we will uh, take seriously the idea that maybe these are the unobservable Big Bangs. And it'll conceptually be very important because we then have to ask, are they governed by the same physics as ours or not? And uh, uh, just to tell an anecdote, I was on a panel about 10 years ago um, uh, where we were asked um, if you were asked to bet um, uh, uh, on a multiverse, um, how would you bet? Would you bet your goldfish, your dog, or your life? I said I was nearly at the dog level. I thought it was quite likely. 
Andre Linde was there, and he said he'd almost bet his life he'd spent 25 years developing this model. And uh, Steven Weinberg, the great theorist, said, well, he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. Um, well, as it turns out, I think uh, um, Andre Linde, my dog and I will all be dead before this is settled, uh, but nonetheless, it's an important question. And my point is, it's speculative science, it's not just speculation. Well, uh, just uh, um, to, to finish with something a bit closer to uh, immediate uh, challenges, um, let me just uh, show two pictures which are really aimed at the younger people in the audience who are uh, thinking perhaps about a career in astronomy. And I want to emphasize how, an exciting, how exciting it's going to be for them. Um, these are the great observatories for the 2020s. Um, ALMA is already operating. It's, a, it's a, the first global ground-based instrument for contributors from Europe, United States, and Japan. Um, the ELT I showed pics of will on, be online, and James Webb Space Telescope, Square Kilometer Array. All these things will uh, hugely increase the data flow. And the other thing, which is a big uh, uh, excitement, is how much more we can do with computers. Um, uh, focus on computer simulation in understanding galaxy formations I showed, galaxy collisions, um, strong field general relativity, which has been important in, uh, in simulating what happens and the, and the uh, formation of gravitational waves, relativistic MHD, disks and jets around black holes, etc., supernova explosions where you don't put in special symmetry, and plasma microphysics, understanding relativistic plasmas. All these things uh, have been um, uh, developed by uh, computer models. And I speak as a cheerleader because I'm too old to learn new tricks and understand how to, how to code for these things. But uh, it's clear that most of these areas will be hugely progressed by these um, uh, new techniques in computing and data handling and in observations. And so my final slide is this, is Edmund Hubble, a heavy smoker, as you can see. And in his book in the 1930s, he says, only when the range of observations is exhausted, should we move to the dreamy realm of speculation. I've done that a bit, but it's the observations and the battle-tested theory which are going to improve our understanding. So let me finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rees. Uh, I will read out the questions for you. Uh, right. Due to lack of time, I'll, I'll read three questions uh, yes. slowly. So the first question is, what decides that a planet will be tightly locked with its sun or not? This is from Pratyush Badnagar from uh, CBS. Yes. Um, well, it, it's, it's really analogous to, uh, to, to, the, to the moon. I mean, it depends on tidal dissipation. Um, and uh, the moon is locked with the Earth because of tidal dissipation in the Earth. And uh, planets which are close to a star uh, are going to be tidally locked because there's an interaction between um, uh, their slight non-sphericity and dissipation. So, uh, uh, crudely speaking, the ones close in uh, can, be, can be locked. Um, and that was the case for those ones in that miniature solar system. So the follow-up question was, can Earth be locked to Sun as Moon to Earth in times to come? Uh, in principle, but I think it would, uh, uh, it would take much, much longer than the uh, uh, time that the Earth has, because the, the Sun has been around for four and a half billion years, and it's got about six billion years more. Um, during that time, um, the uh, orbits of the planets may uh, shift around quite a bit, uh, but um, uh, I think no one expects that the Earth will get so close to the sun that that effect will happen. So that's one thing you needn't worry about. And okay. you needn't worry too much about Andromeda hitting us because uh, that, that, will, uh, that, that won't affect the solar system very much. Okay. So uh, now I'll ask question, uh, the question, how are we sure that the reason of the blockage of starlight is due to the passi passing of some planet? and not anything else like disturbance space caused by planet or any other phenomena from Mohammed Hussain. Well, at the moment, it's uh, um, 
uh, it's simply that uh, it, it is regular um, and, uh, um, and 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 uh, and and fits that, that probability. I mean, we we can't be completely sure, but uh, uh, the, the fact that it's regular, and as, as you saw, um, it's definite dips, um, which do indicate something with a sharp edge. Um, I, I think uh, no one would. Uh, have any equally plausible alternative to the idea that it was planets of some kind, um, uh, which produce those uh, um, those very obvious and strictly periodic dips. So I think it's just the most most likely theory. Okay. So uh, one more question: so How does the conservation of angular momentum force the clouds to collapse into protoplanetary disks? Um, well, the, the um, uh, Th that doesn't. I mean, uh, a typical cloud will contract um, under gravity. I mean, if if it uh, cools down so that the pressure holding it up can't be overwhelmed by gravity, so uh, the star will um, the, the cloud will start contracting under its own gravity. And um, uh, if it's got even a small amount of, of, of angular momentum, then as it contracts, it will uh, spin up faster like the ballerina pulling in her arms and all that. And uh, uh, if it has too much angular momentum to all go into a protostar, then what happens is that some of the mass goes into the protostar and the angular momentum is left behind in, in the disk. And it's from that disk that the, the planets form. And uh, you could put in numbers and say that uh, um, in order for some of the angular momentum to have to be left behind, the spin of the original protostar, when it was an interstellar, cloud had to be very, very low. So in almost all cases, you would expect that the protostar has an angular momentum problem, which it has to solve by spinning off a disk. Okay, so we have more questions, but uh, since uh, we are running out of time, uh, so I will not take more, take any more question. Uh, let us thank, I'll thank for everybody, uh, for Martin Reese's lecture, a great lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, so after so can we, uh, yeah, uh, Ram Prakash. Ram Prakash. No, no, that was a mistake. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, okay, fine. Okay, fine. Okay, good. Fine. Uh, so we now move to uh, uh, Professor Subhi Sarkar. So let me introduce to Sarkar. Uh, Subhi Sarkar is a Professor of Physics at uh, Rudolf Perel Center for Theoretical Physics, Oxford and also an adjunct professor at uh, Raman Research Institute, Bangalore. He did his PhD at TIFR. His research is mainly at the interface between astrophysics, cosmology, and fundamental physics concerning uh, dark matter, inflation, and neutrino cosmology. He has received many awards, including the Bruno Rossi Prize of the American Astronomical Society for the Ice Cube collaboration in 2021, and IUPAP TIFR Humi Baba Phil, uh, um, Award, in 2017. So uh, he has been working on many interesting topics, including uh, at zero tension, dark matter, ultra energy cosmic rays. Today, he's going to talk to us about testing cosmic ray acceleration in the laboratory. Over to you, Professor Bar Subhi Sarkar. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is an uh, honor to be invited to speak at this uh, memorial symposium for Kumar Chitre. Um, Actually, this is the second time I'm giving a virtual talk at uh, your center. Uh, the previous time was on neutrino physics. Uh, but I would like to talk today about, um, in fact, what I worked on for my PhD thesis at the Tata Institute over 40 years ago, uh, when I first met Kumar, because I think uh, it is something that he would have liked to hear about. It connects to his interests. And uh, this has come about because in the uh, last few years, I have uh, fallen into the company of uh, a bunch of physicists uh, who work with high-powered lasers. They are plasma physicists, but they are a new breed. They, in fact, uh, uh, do experiments in the laboratory with high-powered lasers to recreate uh, astrophysical conditions. That is uh, our conceit that we can do that. And to illustrate this, I have put up a picture here. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. Uh, this picture here uh, really doesn't make much sense to you, but it might do so more if I superimpose on it 
a picture of the supernova remnant of Cassiopeia A, uh, which is, uh, you know, tens of light years across. And the scale of this little plasma blob in the picture is only about a millimeter. So the concept is that we can indeed reproduce uh, the physics of what is going on in this vast shock waves out in space by doing experiments in the laboratory. And this is ensured uh, by the scale-free nature of the underlying equations uh, in magnetohydrodynamics. And that was something that uh, Kumar was very interested in. And although uh, I never worked with him directly, uh, we did discuss physics quite a lot. And he would have particularly liked uh, you know, being an ardent Anglophile, although he went to the other place, he would have liked the fact that we now uh, have a, a collaboration going between uh, Oxford and the nearby Rutherford Laboratory with colleagues in India, in particular, uh, Professor uh, Ravindra Kumar's group at uh, the Uphill Group at the Tata Institute, and uh, uh, his uh, colleague uh, M. Krishnamurti, who's uh, in fact at the uh, Tata Institute uh, in Hyderabad, uh, and uh, the PI there is in fact uh, Vandana Sharma, who is at IIT Hyderabad, where I visited uh, just before uh, the pandemic and lectured there. And uh, a few months ago, we organized a online workshop, which was attended by a lot of people. There is growing interest in this subject in India. And um, I owe my involvement in all this to uh, this gentleman here in the right-hand lower corner, that's Gianluca Gregory, my colleague in the Clarendon Laboratory here. And below that is Rajiv Patathil, who is uh, uh, at the Rutherford Lab Laser Center. Uh, he was earlier in the TIFR. So you can see that it's, uh, you know, old uh, comrades and friends who are kind of coming together with new hats on to try and do something uh, which hopefully you will find interesting. And uh, my excuse for talking about this, that this is just the kind of thing I think Kumar would have liked to see. Uh, he and Suvanna did visit us in Oxford several times in recent years. And um, obviously, as Ajit Kimbave said yesterday, it would have been much nicer where we celebrating his birthday with him today. But uh, I think, you know, as physicists, we have to be objective about the world and hold on to our passion that connects us across countries and indeed uh, across all ages and boundaries. So with that uh, as my motivation, let me talk about testing cosmic ray uh, acceleration in the laboratory. So uh, I appreciate that uh, this is a very broad audience. So let me just say a few introductory words about cosmic rays. Uh, these are particles that uh, bombard the Earth from all directions. They were discovered uh, over 100 years ago by Victor Hess. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, measured their uh, arrival directions and energies all the way from a few uh, giga electron volts all the way up to about 10 to the 11 uh, electron volts, which is a huge energy. It is, as you can see here, many orders of magnitude above the energies that are uh, possible to uh, accelerate particles to at the biggest machines uh, on, on the planet, at the Large Hadron Collider. And therefore, uh, apart from the question of how they are accelerated by nature to such energies, they also provide us a free laboratory for studying fundamental interactions at energies which we cannot achieve on Earth. And in detail, uh, the spectrum is, as you can see here, roughly a power law. This is a logarithmic scale, both in the energy and the numbers. Uh, I have actually multiplied the numbers by energy squared to try to make the spectrum less steep than it would otherwise be. And uh, as is also indicated, uh, it consists not just of protons, uh, but also of uh, heavy elements. In fact, here is a panel showing you that every element that you know of uh, is there in cosmic rays because the material from which they're accelerated uh, that we detect on Earth is simply the interstellar medium that has been enriched by uh, supernova explosions and such. 
And they also have a small smattering of uh, electrons and indeed of antimatter, of positrons and antiprotons. And very recently, uh, about a dozen anti-helium nuclei uh, have uh, been seen, although uh, it remains to be shown that they indeed uh, are uh, genuinely anti-helium nuclei, because you're talking now about identifying particles at the level of one in a hundred billion. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as you can see, it's a very interesting uh, laboratory for studying physics. And the uh, uh, spectrum is more or less a featureless power law, although there are little bends here, which in a, our usual anthropomorphic way, we call the knee, and this one is the ankle, and so forth. And they are presumably related to physical phenomena uh, that affect cosmic rays. And uh, we believe that these are accelerated by uh, the remnants of supernovae, which drive shock waves into the interstellar medium at very high velocities. And this, for example, is a supernova that went off in 1680 uh, in the constellation of Cassiopeia, which in fact was not seen uh, visibly as the ones that Martin told us about, the Crab Nebula was, because uh, this was presumably obscured, although the uh, English astronomer Royal Flamstead did record a little nebulosity in that direction. And this is now uh, expanding outwards at 10,000 kilometers a second still. It's still in free expansion, and that's how it looks uh, in X-rays as seen from Chandra. And this is how it looks in the radio as seen from the very large array. And you can see that it is shining in synchrotron radiation. In fact, the synchrotron extends to uh, tens of TeV uh, to X-rays, and the thinness of the X-ray filaments also tells you uh, that uh, the electrons are being generated in situ. Uh, they cannot live very long at those energies against radiation losses. Uh, and in some supernova remnants, uh, there is also evidence for uh, the acceleration of protons because we see gamma rays with a spectrum that is characteristic of uh, the decay of neutral pions, which would be created when they uh, interact with the ambient matter. And a supernova such as this would result from uh, stellar evolution as is depicted in this cartoon. Uh, of course, there are further details that I'm not talking about here. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, it suffices to uh, point out that uh, the Energy density of cosmic rays in the galaxy is of order about a third of an electron volt per cubic centimeter. Uh, interestingly, uh, comparable also to the energy density of starlight, of the microwave radiation, of many other things. And in fact, of kinetic motions, because these cosmic rays are in uh, balance, uh, uh, pressure balance with the rest of the interstellar medium. And they occupy an extended halo around the galaxy, and the total energy is there for this. And we know they uh, knock around the galaxy for about 20 million years from radioactive dating of isotopes in the cosmic rays. So we need so much power to generate that population. No, no, no. Sorry? Oh, dear. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, energy input can uh, be uh, uh, managed by the supernovae. They go off about 3 per century. If they put out uh, so much energy in cosmic rays, which is just a few percent of the kinetic energy of the explosion, uh, which is around 10 to the 51 ergs, or foes as they are called in the business. Now, uh, this is not the only such environment where we see evidence of turbulence, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence generated by shock waves. You also see it in the giant uh, lobes of radio galaxies that we heard about yesterday from Professor Gopal Krishna, or indeed the recently discovered uh, so-called Fermi bubbles, which are giant blobs of plasma that uh, extend both sides of the galactic center. Uh, presumably uh, created at a time when the central black hole of our galaxy was uh, not uh, quite as it is today, but was in fact feeding as it were. And uh, my claim in this talk will be that the mechanism that is generating this synchrotron radiation uh, in these cases, and uh, indeed the uh, gamma rays uh, even that come from this could be inverse Compton, uh, scattering of the same radiovistic electrons that are generating synchrotron. 
and that they are being accelerated by uh, the turbulence that is uh, present in these environments. And the process is the one that Enrico Fermi talked about, uh, you know, nearly 80 years ago. And uh, uh, for the experts in the audience, this might come as a bit of a surprise because we are always being told that the process that accelerates cosmic rays is in fact so-called diffusive shock acceleration, which is a somewhat different process. But uh, more recently, uh, for those who want details, uh, you can look at these interesting reviews by Vai Petrosian and Lemoine, uh, which argue that indeed a uh, second order process could be just as important as the first order process. But let me start my story back to when I was a graduate student and uh, the paper that I started reading uh, under the guidance of Ramnath Kausik, who was my supervisor, was this by Steve Gull, who is at the uh, Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And he had done the first simulation of what happens when you throw out matter at high velocity in a shell, as happens in a supernova. And basically, it goes into free expansion. This is the radius versus the time. Uh, and uh, this is about uh, uh, one, uh, well, 10, 100 years here. And this is a 1,000 years. And basically, you can see that it's expanding as uh, the radius proportional to time, undecelerated, but then slowly it slows down and goes into this behavior, uh, which goes as r goes as t to the two fifths. This is the sedov taylor solution, the self-similar expansion. And at that point, a convection zone develops. And this is because this piston, as, it, as he called it, the matter thrown out from the supernova, is being decelerated as it accretes matter from the interstellar medium. And you know that, uh, as Einstein told us, if you sit in the frame of a decelerating object, it feels like there is a gravitational field in the opposite direction. So you will have the classic uh, rayleigh tiller instability, which I have chosen to illustrate here with this picture of a cloud. And precisely these rayleigh tiller instability that you see here at the bottom of the cloud will also happen in a supernova remnant, as Gull uh, outlines here. And that will generate a turbulent zone because these filaments are further subject to what's called the kelvin helmholtz instability. Uh, you can imagine that the boundary layer here is unstable to shear. Uh, because it doesn't know whether it should stay still or, uh, you know, which medium it should be part of. And this will generate a turbulent medium. And uh, Gull calculated that uh, that would take up a few percent of the energy, uh, kinetic energy of the shock. And uh, if it was equipartition between the magnetic field and uh, radiativistic particles, uh, you would generate enough power uh, to create the synchrotron radio emission. So this was 1973, and uh, if I fast forward to 1996, now we have better computers, and you can actually see those instabilities in more detail. Uh, this is still two-dimensional. Here is three dimensions, and now we are in color. Uh, this is now in the 21st century, and you can see the details of that kelvin helmholtz instability I mentioned developing. So uh, we are now fairly certain that uh, all this is uh, indeed what happens because this would predict that the magnetic field in the supernova remnant would be radially drawn out and turbulent. And you can infer that from the fact that the radio emission and the polarized component uh, anticorrelate, and that is a signature of a turbulent medium. Um, I can't resist showing this even more recent simulation, uh, basically state of the art, which shows everything I have said so far in uh, much more detail. Here is the blast wave going out. And as it gets slowed down, a, a second shock wave, the reverse shock wave gets driven into the ejector. And you can see uh, this is uh, 100 years. This is 300 years. This is about the age of uh, Cassiopeia A. And as time goes on, uh, the uh, outward going shock wave uh, uh, will not any longer move at constant velocity, it will be slowed down and go into this set of Taylor self-similar phase, as you see here. And in between the two shock waves, you'll have this turbulent medium. So the whole uh, turbulence lasts only as long as this slowing down is going on. Once you are well into the set of Taylor phase, it will fade away. So this coincides with the emergence of supernova remnants as radio sources. So it gives a natural explanation 
or why uh, the emission that we see from them should arise just at that time. And you can see that it cannot be diffusive shock acceleration that is powering them, because in that case, you would have seen the emission right from time zero, uh, because uh, that process happening at the boundary, as I'll show you in a second. Now, our uh, first uh, step was to show that this magnetic field amplification does occur. And this was my first ever paper with Ramnath, which I'm very proud of. And we did what today is called multi-messenger astronomy. So we looked at Cassiopeia A, and we worked out that uh, there is a upper bound on the gamma ray flux from Cassiopeia A set at the time by a satellite called Cos B. And that says that there is an upper limit, therefore, on the density of electrons, which can uh, generate gamma rays by uh, Bremsstrahlen. Because we know the amount of matter in the, in the supernova remnant from the X-ray emission. And uh, therefore, uh, if we combine these two pictures, the radio and the X-ray, then you see we have this equation that the electrons in the magnetic field give you radio and the electrons and the plasma give you gamma rays. So if I have an upper bound on this and a measure of that, then I can uh, work that out into a lower bound on the magnetic field because uh, I, I can't have too many electrons, otherwise I would get too many gamma rays. So the field has to be sufficiently strong to generate the observed radio emission. And uh, this tells us that the magnetic field in the remnant is at least as strong as, uh, uh, as you see here, 8, 10 to the minus 5 Gauss. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, gamma rays have been detected from Cas A by the MAGIC telescope and uh, also the uh, Veritas uh, telescope uh, in, in the US. And uh, the lower bound now is up to uh, uh, about 10 times that. So uh, that then tells you that the minimum magnetic field there is about 100 micro gauss. And uh, although uh, the emission mechanism is actually not electron beam strolling, it is in fact pi naught decay or inverse Compton. So whatever we are saying here is very conservative. And uh, this uh, 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 amplification of the magnetic field was also then deduced some years later from the fact that the X-ray emitting filaments are very thin. Uh, that says that the electrons are very short-lived, and then you can work out from that uh, what the energy loss rate is, and thereby get a, a lower bound on the magnetic field. So this is all very interesting, but that just tells us you're on the right track. And now we can go back to Fermi's 1949 paper, where he pointed out that if you have uh, two gases, one sort of more energetic than the other, moving faster, then on average, in the collisions between the particles of these two gases, which could be on the one hand cosmic rays and the other hand magnetized clouds, uh, you'd gain energy, you'd have transfer of energy from the one population to another, because although uh, collisions are equally likely in every direction, there is a slightly higher probability of head-on collisions, which will give you an energy gain than uh, collisions which are overtaking. So, I mean, we all know this, when you walk in the rain, it rains a little more on your face than on your back. And uh, if you do some simple uh, special relativistic uh, kinematics, you can work out that to first order, the energy gain and loss cancel. But to second order, there is energy gain, which goes as the square of the velocity of the beta factor. And uh, of course, you don't need magnetized clouds. This same role can be played by MHG turbulence or plasma waves. And um, you essentially, to understand this, you have to solve the Fokker-Planck equation which tells you how these particles diffuse in momentum space, uh, also gain energy systematically or escape. And of course, you have to take into account injection. And uh, many people have worked on this uh, through the years. So I entered the field, as I said, in 1980 uh, or so. But let me also mention the rival theory, which was formulated also by Fermi a few years later. And uh, its modern reincarnation is uh, due to the work of my colleague, Tony Bell at Oxford and Blandford and Ostriker and so on. And there, uh, the process is that uh, the particle is crossing and recrossing the same shock wave many times, because in the frame of the shock wave, the flow is converging from both sides. So it can't escape and it gains energy every time. And therefore, the energy gain is proportional to beta, not to beta square. And therefore, it seems like a more efficient process. 
And this is usually invoked to explain the cosmic ray spectrum. This would give you an e to the minus two spectrum. But if the uh, loss time scale goes as e to the minus 0.7, then you can match the observed spectrum. This is the theory, right? And the uh, uh, efficiencies can be as high as is required to explain uh, supernova remnants as the origin of the cosmic rays in the galaxy. And very quickly, uh, this I want to show this. It's such a simple argument. It's uh, really beautiful. You have the shock wave, which is compressing the incoming stuff. And a, uh, and a very fast shock, adiabatic shock, compresses by a factor of four. So the ratio of the densities on the two sides is factor of four. And if you look at a element in phase space, in six-dimensional momentum and coordinate phase space, and you just ask, uh, uh, what happens to the particles, the phase space density is conserved. So if you compress in uh, spatial space, then you extend it out in momentum space. And this simple argument tells you, uh, therefore, that in equilibrium, when there is no uh, rate of change is zero in the steady state, this will naturally give you a spectrum whose index is just given by the ratio of the velocities on the two sides. And like I said, it's a factor of four. And this therefore then turns out to be a, a, a net slope of uh, minus four. And then when you look at the energy spectrum, so that is P squared times F of P. So that turns out to be e to the minus two. And although this is more efficient because it is first order in beta, what actually matters is how often these scatterings happen. So in one case, it is the shock wave. magnetohydrodynamic hydrodynamic turbulence. But in detail, which one actually is more efficient would depend on the circumstances. And this is a realization that has, uh, 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 you know, maturing more recently, that in some cases, first order uh, diffusive shock acceleration is not as good an explanation of what is going on as the second order process can be, because the scattering is happening fast enough for this to be relevant. And this could be, for example, lobes of radio galaxies, supernova remnants, and so forth. And let me give you uh, uh, a very quickly, I mean, I realize I don't have much time, but I just want to show you that how much power one gains over the problem if you can uh, formulate it mathematically, albeit with considerable simplification, and get an analytic answer, not, not have to do the whole thing numerically. So this is what I did for my thesis. We, I looked at the diffusion equation for particles which are in a flux tube in the turbulent region in the supernova remnant, as described by Gull. And so you have a competition between the Betatron acceleration because the magnetic field is changing in time. So the particles are tied to the field, their energies will change. But at the same time, the flux tube is being drawn out radially. So they will lose energy and there's a competition between the two. And then you have a diffusion in phase space uh, due to the scatterings, which is described by this term here. And you have injection and then you, of course you have escape, right? And uh, I spent a few months trying to solve this equation and uh, realized that I could actually do an integral transform to uh, make it look like the heat equation for which, as you know, the solution is a Gaussian. But because of this integral transform, the solution now turns out to be what's called a log normal distribution. And, um, and then of course, once you have the green function, you can get it for any arbitrary injection, uh, you can get the full energy spectrum. So these are all scanned from my thesis, which was typewritten those days because we didn't have tech and LaTeX and all that, right? And uh, you see, these are also figures from my thesis with Ramnath uh, Kausik. And you, if I inject particles at E equals E naught, uh, you see they're diffusing out uh, and uh, it looks like the solution to the heat equation, but you see that there is a slight imbalance. There are more particles on the right than on the left. And that's because there is a net energy gain. And because I'm conserving the number of particles under that uh, curve is one particle. So the amplitude is coming down, but if I keep injecting particles, then uh, that gets smoothed out and I start developing a power law. 
And this solution uh, was rediscovered many years later. I'm afraid I left the field. I switched to doing cosmology because I met Dennis Sharma at Oxford and he turned me on to a different subject. But many years later, uh, this solution was rediscovered and has become now quite interesting. And more recently, a, a student of mine, Philip Merch, he generalized it for arbitrary momentum and time dependence. So you can see how a, a power law spectrum develops. And then you can work out the synchrotron radiation from that power law spectrum. And it is looking even better because you integrate over the synchrotron kernel. And what this is showing is that if I accelerate particles with an energy doubling time of 200 years, I will actually get a spectrum that looks very much like Cassiopeia A uh, at about the right time. right? And this is also, of course, relevant to other new supernova remnants that are being discovered, like this one here, G1.9 plus 0.3, the remnant of the supernova 87A in the Large Magellanic Cloud and so forth. And uh, so this is the kind of punchline. This is a fit to the spectrum of Cassiopeia A, which is the uh, brightest radio source in the sky, and therefore its flux is very well measured. And what you see here is a one parameter fit. It is fitted by just taking the rate of uh, energy uh, in, uh, increase of the electrons, one number. And I have put a straight line next to it to illustrate that it is not a power law. It is slightly curved downwards, as you can see. And that is hard to get. That is not what diffusive shock acceleration would predict. In fact, that would predict something going the other way. Uh, whereas this is predicting a downward curved spectrum, and that is just what we get from first principles, and uh, it distinguishes it from first order uh, acceleration. And in fact, with that one number fixed by the fit to the spectrum, I can actually predict at what rate the spectrum is flattening with time, as you saw in the previous plots, and that actually matches the data with no free parameters at all. So, you know, I, I, you can see why I was very proud of the solution. It gave a dynamical explanation for young supernova remnants. Now, fast forward many more years, I returned to this subject because these Fermi bubbles were discovered uh, in uh, the data by actually people independent of the Fermi collaboration because the data is made available to the public. And um, they also found that in coincident with the uh, gamma ray bubbles uh, seen by Fermi, there was also a so-called radio haze. This was seen by W map and then by Planck. So it looked like there are two kinds of non-thermal emission coming from here. And uh, we, again, uh, we thought this might be an example of turbulence being generated by this shock wave that is blowing out. We can see the shock wave in X-rays, in ROSAD data. And uh, so uh, with Philip Merch, my then student, we returned to the same problem to try to see if you could explain the gamma rays as due to the inverse Compton scattering of the same electrons that are generating the synchrotron radiation. And to cut a long story short, uh, this uh, was motivated by the fact that uh, we see this Fermi bubbles are uh, limb brightened. And that is not uh, what you would expect if they were actually filled with cosmic rays, to get that, you would need to accelerate the cosmic rays at the boundaries. And uh, that is that was the reason why we didn't believe that this was due to cosmic rays blown off from the center of the galaxy. We, we said they must be being accelerated in situ. So again, the same uh, diffusion equation, but now we have to take into account losses. I'm sorry, I don't have time to do justice to all the details here, but uh, why Petrosian and Lukas Towards actually solved it, including the energy loss, and showed there would be a pileup in the spectrum uh, at the high energy end. And all this actually matches the data very well. So let me cut to the chase. This is the actual data on the gamma rays from Fermi. And by normalizing to that, one now fixes the theory uh, completely. And one can then predict the radio spectrum. And as you can see here, uh, the models that we derive from the inverse Compton emission provide a very good match to the radio data as well. So again, I'm pretty convinced that this is the right theory for the Fermi bubbles and not hadronic uh, uh, emission from uh, cosmic ray protons or whatever. That's a rival theory. Uh, the bad news is that if this is true, then my colleagues on Ice Cube are not going to see any neutrinos because uh, this is all being generated by electrons. 
Okay, so I think that was the preamble. Let me come to the actual topic of my uh, talk, which is how do you investigate all this using lasers? Now, what you see here is the bay of the uh, Los, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, in San Francisco, where there are a huge number of lasers, 192 beams, which can momentarily, they use up as much energy as the rest of the world. Uh, when they fired these things. Of, fortunately, it's only for, uh, you know, tens of nanoseconds. And these can actually create for us uh, little uh, blobs of plasma that uh, replicate what is happening in supernova remnants. And all this has been made possible uh, since the 1990s, as you see here, but the development of this uh, so-called chirp pulsed uh, amplification technique. And these have allowed the people who use these lasers to do very interesting experiments, not just uh, laboratory astrophysics, as I'm discussing, but also look at fundamental physics, because in fact, you're getting to the point where you can have breakdown of the vacuum by the huge fields that you create in this. And uh, you can investigate many interesting phenomena, which I will not uh, discuss here. So Martin showed a picture of the early universe with this time scale. Uh, I'm showing here how we are progressing towards that with this laboratory experiments, not quite there yet, but getting there. And these lasers are uh, all over the world. The ones that we mainly use as the one in the Rutherford lab I mentioned, uh, there is one in Paris, uh, there is uh, one, uh, 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 this SNF is the one in the Lawrence Livermore lab, uh, there is one in Japan, and of course in India also we have high-powered lasers, so Ravindra has his own lasers in his lab at TIFR, there is one uh, that has been installed uh, recently in Hyderabad, and there are uh, one or two others. And in general, you can apply to have time on these through a, a review process if you make a science case. And uh, very quickly, uh, the reason why we believe that these laser experiments can actually match astrophysical conditions is because the equations of MHD have no intrinsic scale. Uh, to, in order for this to be true, the Reynolds number, so again, I don't have time to do justice to these equations, but uh, just want to emphasize that there is this Reynolds number that uh, de determines uh, whether or not that statement is correct. So that is in the denominator here. So you can see that if this RE and RM, the as Reynolds number is large enough, then these terms will be negligible and there will be no scale in the problem. So the same equation should hold whether your plasma is one millimeter across or a hundred light years across, okay? So if you will allow me to uh, uh, sort of claim that, then uh, if we can uh, generate uh, plasmas with these high Reynolds numbers, then we can actually recreate the conditions for uh, astrophysical processes. And this is done by uh, focusing those lasers onto little foils, uh, uh, which are usually deuterated. They have deuterium and tritium on them. So they evaporate and create plasmas, which are blown through holes in a grid and which then interact with each other. And you have then a detector nearby, which is interesting enough, usually something very um, uh, robust, like a sheet of CR39, uh, which is interestingly what I worked on also as a student at TIFR to measure cosmic rays with. And uh, you can't put delicate instruments in that neighborhood, obviously, but you can detect them with plastic track detectors. And uh, we have been uh, doing that. So this simulation here shows uh, what uh, actually happens when you do a so-called PIC simulation of uh, the plasma, as you see here, interacting uh, uh, with uh, uh, the two blobs interacting and creating turbulence. And the conditions in that region, uh, some numbers are given here to try to uh, illustrate that we can actually get up to uh, the kind of parameter values that one would need in order to recreate a supernova remnant. Uh, this is the kind of turbulent magnetic field that is being created. The turbulent velocity is given here. And as you see here, the Reynolds number is sufficiently large that we can say that uh, we are in the scale-free regime uh, to, to do this. Uh, and that is why you need a big laser like NIF. You can't do this experiment, for example, at the Rutherford lab. And then you can solve the same problem that I discussed earlier with you. And this was done actually by my student, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Konstantin Bayer uh, at Oxford. Uh, he led us on this and he worked out uh, the diffusion coefficients 
And in some detail, again, uh, I have to skip over this uh, for lack of time. But the point is that the product of this uh, diffusion and momentum and the uh, corresponding diffusion in uh, uh, spatial coordinates that goes as p square. So the same solution that uh, I had actually found uh, 40 years earlier applies both to relativistic and non-relativistic case. And then you have to check that uh, the time scales uh, works so that you can, in fact, argue for enough time for acceleration to happen in the time that the particles that you are injecting are crossing the turbulent plasma. And uh, we were basically in the borderline region at NIF, uh, even with so many lasers, uh, it's kind of you know really borderline. But we did get the time on the uh, experiment and we did it. And our prediction was that this is how the particles should behave according to the diffusion equation we had solved. And of course, what you're detecting is what escapes rather than what is inside the plasma. So you have to integrate over uh, this kernel here. And uh, we had therefore a exact theoretical prediction for what the experimentalist should see. And uh, uh, essentially we expect that the width of this distribution should increase by about uh, a couple of hundred KeV. Uh, and uh, this was said to us to be detectable. So the, we did the experiment and here is the sheet of CR39 that was exposed. And you can see that the blobs that were left by those uh, protons, which are injected into the plasma, have got a bit wider as expected. Unfortunately, uh, when this was put into an edge pit, the, the holes actually uh, were well messed up. Uh, uh, you know, This experiment did not work. Nevertheless, I'm showing this to you because one thing that you learn when you start doing experiments is that they don't go right most of the time. And this is something that you have to expect, accept uh, as, a, as an experimentalist and you have to try, try and try again. And uh, normally when you write papers, we only talk about the successes. We never talk about the failures. So I just thought I would show you a failure to say that uh, you know this was disappointing, but you haven't given up. We have got another time uh, uh, on this NIF and we'll try again. But we have had other successes. Let me mention very quickly two of them uh, to show you uh, what we managed to do. And this was really at the Lully laser in Paris, uh, it's run by Ecole Polytechnic. So in order for any particle acceleration to work, you have to already have a population of energetic particles. And then there's a big problem in understanding where these relativistic particles come from, from the thermal plasma. This is called the injection problem. And in principle, this can happen due to other plasma instabilities, such as this two stream instability, uh, which I had discussed earlier. And this can happen uh, uh, in a plasma theoretically. Question is, does it happen in practice? And what we uh, did to simulate this was to uh, put a little foil uh, in the way of a part of this uh, plasma that is created by uh, firing lasers at a little foil in the Lully uh, experiment. And this is similar to the Earth's magneto sheet, which is protecting us from the solar wind. And this was interesting to us because this could also alternatively be a comet and comets are observed to uh, uh, emit X-rays. And you might wonder how the coldest objects in the universe, which is a comet, can, ex can uh, emit X-rays. So we did this experiment to uh, check the possibility that the X-rays are coming from particles that are being accelerated there. And indeed, uh, when we did the experiment, we found that uh, X-rays can be generated uh, uh, because a shock is created where the magnetic field is present. And uh, this two-stream instability is generated because the plasma beta is about 0.2. And we verified this with these fixed simulations. And that confirmed that indeed we are seeing this lower hybrid instability heating of the electrons near the shock. This was published in Nature. And uh, that was very pleasing because we solved a old problem of how com comets emit X-rays. And uh, one last topic, which is to measure the diffusion of the uh, injected protons into that blob of plasma, uh, which we the protons have created from an imploding deuterium tritium capsule. These are actually fusion protons. 
And uh, so as these protons go through, uh, they will be scattered by the magnetic irregularities and they'll diffuse. And so you'll get a smearing of that imprint. And we did see the smearing of the imprint as you see here. And we even measured the spectrum of the turbulence this k to the minus five third is the famous Kolgomorov form. And we do see that the turbulence follows that uh, over some range in wave number. And uh, basically the actual picture, this is a simulation, but if you could look into what is going on there, you would have seen something like that. And uh, uh, I was very pleased on this paper to have on board uh, Ellen Zweibel, who is somebody that I uh, got to know uh, as a graduate student when I went to the first Eriche conference uh, school in Cosmic Rays in, I think it was 1978 or something. And uh, she is now a professor of plasma physics in Wisconsin. And she joined us on this uh, experiment and analysis. And we are very pleased to observe this diffusive transport. So I, I'm really sorry to have gone well over my time. But uh, I think it's very exciting that we can actually do all these things. We have already demonstrated. I, I was not involved in this first work. This was the work of my colleagues, Alex uh, Shekuchihin and Gianluca Gregory and others, uh, that you can create magnetic fields and uh, by this so-called Beerman battery mechanism and amplify them by the dynamo. Uh, I was involved in this second experiment where we injected fusion protons uh, and measured their moment and space diffusion. And the challenge is to now measure this Fermi acceleration. Uh, the first attempt did not work, but we are hopeful of the next one. And in fact, it would be interesting to simulate first order diffusive shock acceleration if we can think of a proper setup to do so. So, the bottom line is uh, we can't yet make an universe in the laboratory, but actually we can nearly make a supernova. And I find that to be tremendously exciting. So thank you for uh, indulging me and in letting me go beyond my time. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop there and I'll just put up a picture of my collaborators so you can see that they are uh, uh, at many different institutions and they include a number of theorists who have marked out in blue uh, in addition to the experimentalists who do the hard lifting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarkar. Uh, we are really running out of time, so I yes. will pick up two questions. Uh, Thank you. Uh, okay. So the first question is by Vatsal Trivedi. Uh, what is qualitatively the difference between second order and first order diffusion acceleration? Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, it's that uh, one process, uh, both are uh, the second order process is uh, particles rattling against randomly moving magnetic irregularities like uh, plasma waves, etc. So uh, to first order, you don't gain energy because you lose as much as you gain, but you get a second order gain because the number of head on collisions is slightly more than the number of overtaking collisions. Whereas in the first order process, you are crossing and recrossing the same shock wave over and over again and gaining energy each time. So that is first order in the velocity, right? But both processes depend on diffusion because without that, of course, uh, you know, you have to change your direction and go back to where you are scattered. If you just leave the system, then you only get one shot. So in detail, uh, the difference between first and second order was illustrated on one of my slides. Uh, and, you know, this subject, as I said, goes back to Enrico Fermi in 1950. So uh, uh, there is a huge literature on both of these things, which I invite you to take a look at. Okay. So the second question is by Arush Murli. Uh, how does uh, convection within a star affect the turbulence of the magnetic field? So... Uh, uh, not all st stars have convection zones. Uh, some of them have more marked ones than others, but the magnetic field at the surface of the star uh, is not a product of the convection zone as such. So stars have got trapped magnetic field from the matter from which they condense. We are talking here about generating a magnetic field, uh, uh, amplifying a magnetic field that was already frozen in into the interstellar matter that was swept up by the supernova remnant. However, a strong shock wave can only compress a magnetic field by a factor of four. Whereas if you recall, if I may go back to my uh, uh, slide, the factor by which we, we saw the amplification of the magnetic field uh, in Cassiopeia A was a lot more than a factor of four, okay? 
and because the interstellar magnetic field is like a few micro gauss and the point is that uh, since the magnetic field is frozen into the plasma it's all a conducting medium if i increase the density uh, the uh, magnetic field uh, adiabatically will also increase and uh, the particles are uh, which are tied to the magnetic field will also gain energy so everything is being done in the uh, uh, it, it, everything follows adiabaticity and frozen in field the field is conserved what turbulence brings in is the possibility of amplifying the field by winding it round and round on small scales and then we look at the broad average picture and it looks like a stronger magnetic field fine uh Thank you very much, Professor Sarkar. Uh, there are three more questions, but due to lack of time, I think the next session starts in five minutes. Okay. So because of which I could I could not ask these questions. So mm. for so it was a great talk. So uh, let me just thank uh, Professor Sarkar on thank you very everybody. Much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see my collaborator Ravindra is online. Thank you. Ravindra. Actually, he asked a question as well. Actually, he asked a question. I think I couldn't. Uh, maybe you can ask him later. Actually. That's okay, I can do. That. Thank you okay. so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. So, uh, so I just wanted to make one announcement. So we have received plenty of questions, and so all of you can actually continue sending your questions if any. We will make sure that they reach the speaker. We will uh, contact the speakers with the questions and uh, update them on the site. Any responses that we have. Absolutely.